All right, warm welcome to everyone. Um, uh, our uh, guest tonight is Colby Dickinson. Uh, Colby is a professor of theology at Loyola University, Chicago. His research interests are political theology, continental philosophy and theology, and contextual theologies, feminist and postcolonial theologies. Um, to name but a few of his publications, uh, is theology as autobiography. This is the most recent one. The challenge of God, theology and contemporary continental philosophy and Colby is publishing with Bloomsbury and Roman and Littlefield and so on. Um, my name uh, is Katarzyna Kochi. I am a Lisa, FF Lisa Meitner Research Fellow and a Research Director of the project uh, Woman Without a Name. Um, and uh, I will tell you uh, some, something about the, uh, tonight. Uh, Colby will uh, give his lecture. I will give a short response or comment and um, kick off one question. And then the floor will be open to questions. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot do uh, the uh, typical Q&A that we are used to at the Institute because uh, of the uh, GDPR, um, but you will be able to type your questions to, uh, to the chat and I will read them for Colby and Colby will gladly answer your questions. And uh, that is about it. I hope I did not forget anything and uh, Colby, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for having me and for inviting me uh, to give this talk, uh, Dr. Kochi. And I appreciate very much uh, your setting this up and for the, the technical details as well. Um, I really wish I could be with all of you and, and see people in person, which I much prefer, uh, but we're making do with the situation. And I'm going to speak to you today about uh, political mythologies and some of the divisions in continental thought regarding political mythologies and how we understand them in relation specifically to sovereignty and sovereign power. So I'll go ahead and begin. Sovereignty has a terribly old secret. It is at its core empty. The emperor is naked as the old tale symbolically puts it. The emperor walks down the street wearing no clothes, fully displaying the vacuity of his power, and yet he retains his authority because no one dares to challenge this oldest fabrication of human society. No matter how egregious its deception remains, it is as if those in power knew and know that there was nothing substantial to their political reign, but that also there is no other way by which to embody their position. There is only the necessary illusion that we all adhere to and take to be the exact measure of sovereign power. This is precisely why historically the sacred is another name for sovereignty. The problem of our time, however, is not that there is no small child crying out from the crowd, pleading with everyone to see that the emperor is naked. There are in fact almost too many people who are all too aware of the situation who do attempt to expose the vacuity of power as too with the falseness of sacrality but who for reasons not always entirely clear to us, continue to fail to eradicate the network of operations sustained by sovereign power. There is a permanent tension between those who would seek to legitimate the mythological narratives that sustain the powers that be, and those who would gamble for their termination so that a more precise, even perhaps scientific vision of the present can be maintained. The problem may be, however, that we human citizens of this world we inhabit have not yet conceded that the condition of sovereignty itself implies the perpetual existence of necessary illusions called forth by us in order to sustain our social life. Whether we call them necessary illusions, shared myths, or even alternative facts as politically and scientifically destructive as that last phrase has been recently in my own country, we depend upon fabrications in order to maintain our sense of sovereignty and the many identities that flow from it. In short, sovereignty, as with sacrality, no longer appears in our world as if dropped from heaven by divine mandate upon the monarch of a given nation or people. 
The secular world in which we now reside has jettisoned this fanciful notion, though it's retained the political principle intact, secularizing its theological claims and failing to see that the way in which sovereignty functions still deploys many a metaphysical ruse in order to buttress its claims to power. In fact, the ways in which sovereign, the sovereignty of God was depicted theologically over a thousand years ago within Christendom is often startlingly similar to debates regarding executive or sovereign power in a juridical context today. For example, we're still pondering with great intent the simplest of questions regarding the structure and operations of political systems. Does God or the king or the president, prime minister, have the power to act beyond established laws, say of nature or juridical systems, without calling into question the entire political theological edifice upon which their power rests? One would be right to wonder, as so many continue to, just how is this edifice continuously passed along throughout time, seemingly without interruption? It's with this question in mind that I revisit an older symbolism of this continuity of power, the political theological legacy of the king's two bodies, for example. The myth of the king's two bodies fascinates us still because it's a concrete example of what sustains continuity for the fiction of the crown. The king's two bodies being here, a sense that the king has his temporal earthly body, which dies when he dies, but also another body, a body that can be constructed in effigy, and that seems to continue the power of the king even when the actual body dies. Both the office and the dignity associated with the king are preserved with this metaphysical myth that replicates sovereignty down through the medieval era in European history. The myth of the dual natures of the king, given form in these two bodies, is not alone, however, in presenting us with an embodiment of sovereign power. It's preserved in so many other dualistic figures of political theology, such as Christ's two natures, the doctrine of the two swords, as well as one might argue, something like Martin Luther's Theologies of Glory and Theology of the Cross. Western theology is in reality cluttered with those dualistic representations that seek to sustain and legitimate sovereignty in a variety of forms through recourse to the entwinement of a mythological narrative and its philosophical justification, what we take to be the very nature of metaphysics. Debates regarding free will and predestination, for example, are typically little more than proxy wars concerning the validity of divine rule, which often runs aground on the issue of theodicy, the legitimation question posed to God's authority and sovereignty. A certain constellation is observable too between these dualistic symbols and arguments and the modern Cartesian split between the mind and the body, which bears witness in its own unique way to the secularization of sovereign power in the modern period, as it manifests itself in the very bodies of subjects now said to be sovereign over themselves. And this is the very thing that propagates democracy in the modern era. We might go so far as to suggest that the core of Western metaphysics is preserved and maintained whole scale in a sort of secularized mind-body dualism that still governs our perceptions of the human being, typically with the mind governing the body. What is performed in these political theological movements is the construction of order itself, the privilege of sovereign power. By splitting the king, Christ, or the self into two parts, one constructs order through the exclusion of one half. It's no surprise that the so-called eternal and universal element is what survives in the king's other body upon the death of his actual human body, just as Christ's divinity trumps his humanity, even if both are said to fully coexist with one another. Likewise, as is generally observed, it's the abstracted logic of the universal mind that dominates over the particularities of a material body, the favoring of a rationality over an emotional landscape, just as humanity implicitly assumes its domination over nature, as man too has dominated over woman, or as dominant cultures persevere over other less fortunate ones. This calculus has obvious historical examples and I think can be traced in numerous directions at once. Order itself is constructed, however, through such mechanisms of exclusion, granting a sense of identity and community by removing particular elements of difference from the cohesive appeal and political unity of sameness. This is as much a psychical process as it is a political one, for the formation of any representation does entail a reductive, even if bloodless violence, as the philosopher Jacques Derrida once put it. I think this was something that Franz Fanon brilliantly portrayed in his works on the possibility of decolonizing. In the context of personal memory and cultural history, however, as 
the philosopher Paul Ricoeur has argued, there's always going to be a process of exclusion or forgetting that must be allowed to do its work so that a memory can function at all, so that it can be happy, as he put it. The selection of certain memories over others, it would seem, is also a necessary illusion, if you will, that sustains the sense of self we adhere to. To form a concept of something from society to the self is to reduce the always more complex reality of the thing itself, so that something, anything, might be pronounced in that most reductive but necessary of all mediums, language. The cost of a shared intelligibility between persons is the support we must give to and the adoration we reserve for, the necessary illusions, or we could say the myth of language. In these meditations, we're never far from metaphysics. For René Girard, for example, the processes of exclusion that give rise to order are legitimated by a sacred aura that appears to justify the processes of exclusion themselves as natural, thereby enshrining violence at the heart of human subjectivity. To be a subject, to have a sense of self, is to engage routinely in this, what he called mimetic desiring, so that a self might be personally articulated and socially identifiable. Metaphysics, if we step back to see it for what it is within a long history of its myriad expressions, is the domain of such sovereign gestures of self-creation. These gestures are what must always appear to us ex nihilo, so that one is not dependent upon a previous narrative, a heteronymous relationship that would only subvert the autonomy behind every sovereign claim. It's easy to see how Girard's critique of the apparatuses of false sacrality, what one could even, I think, extend to our reverence for what uh, the philosopher Giorgio Gambin has called the sacrament of language. We can see how this opens the door to those readings of religious revelations that would denounce falsely deified victims in order to uncover the roots of violence above all else. The traditional schematic that would read history as a progression from mimesis to myth to metaphysics as Adorno and Horkheimer had once put it, has fallen apart today as we realize that not only are, there, are all three processes intertwined, but in truth, we're never very far from the dominance of all three. The acts of imitation that spur on the redoubling of the self, according to Girard's mythography, are precisely what undergird those mythological and eventual metaphysical acts of redoubling that have brought us to this point in history. Lest we forget where we are, to discover the heart of myth is to discover the heart of metaphysics at the same time, even if our contemporary forms of metaphysics are secularized, are as secularized and as undisclosed as they are active and dormant. So let me go into the nature of myth, and I'll say more about this idea of redoubling in a moment. Myth becomes metaphysics through the introduction of philosophical reflection and the justifications it can deliver for our need to remain in a mythological framework. Through the mimetic act of redoubling, we're able to construct metaphysical forms that curtail the violence of myth through recourse to the metaphysical uh, philosophical reflection. We can see a close connection between mimesis and myth regarding their propensity for redoubling, for example, in the work of Roland Barthes, who takes up his analysis of myth primarily as a mode of what he calls second level signification. By adhering to myth's central task of redoubling, we're able to perceive its potential ubiquity, uh, though it's always also rooted in the particular histories of particular peoples. It's by abstracting language from its embodied lived context that myth, he finds, becomes a second order semiological system, not a factual one insofar as it develops itself as a meta language. This is the foundation of philosophy in the West. Such a meta language provides a meta commentary, so to speak on the alignment of signs that pre-exist the mythological narrative, but are subsequently appropriated by a given myth's operational framework. What myth introduces to humanity then is a redoubling of every linguistic proposition, human concept or immediate action, putting them at a remove from humanity at the same time that they are reappropriated. Metaphysics becomes what is constructed through these actions as a sort of mimetic gesture, allowing us to understand why Aristotle had predicated metaphysics upon the redoubled activity of thinking about thought, and Hegel considered it to be what takes place upon reflecting on the concept of the concept. You see, these are the acts of redoubling. These efforts toward redoubling are an offense against an enlightened rationality that would seem to demythologize itself, while they are at the same time the only way for philosophy to establish itself as a critical enterprise, 
since we're never fully or truly able to escape from those mythological necessary illusions that typify human existence and its legitimation of itself. Myth, for Bart, is always in the meta position because it's the only thing that allows us to navigate the discrepancy within human existence between meaning and form, which impoverish, impoverish each other, as he puts it, but necessarily also rely on each other at the same time. In his words, quote, the meaning is always there to present the form, the form is always there to outdistance the meaning. To never be fully settled in one or the other is what gives humanity its characteristic detachment from the immediacy of lived existence, what allows ideas to take root, to flourish, and to revise the material conditions of human life. They are also, if seen from a certain angle, the conditions of metaphor, analogy, and allegory, all processes of language that enable us to convey meaning through form. Myth then, according to Bart, is where we see these registers at work, carving out a space for human existence through linguistic forms. Myth gives rise to philosophy, the way that symbols give rise to thought. What plays itself out on this field is that meaning and form do not contradict each other within myth because they are never in the same place at the same time. Allowing myth to point toward that which is not it at the same time that this non-mythological element must rely upon myth. What this, within this configuration, we can see how so many efforts to base philosophical thought upon non-philosophical foundations are not misplaced. The question of the split between form and meaning or content is an old one, and one that can be perceived at the heart of mythology in the modern period, what has been mistaken as enlightenment, but which is really a more complete capitulation to the mythologies that dominate today's culture industry as Horkheimer and Adorno understood it. Form and content maintain a distance, as Bart too had understood matters, in order to produce an absolutization of form as nature itself. This is not only the power of myth, but of style, he felt. Here we find the combinations of living and non-living elements that defines both myth and style and which renders them inseparable. The uniqueness of the individual is stifled so that they might take their place within a series of formal elements that memorialize them within a past chain of associations. Whether one engages a style as a reference to previous styles or whether one reads oneself and one's life into scripture, the end goal is the same, to allow the substance of one's life, one's content and meaning to be poured into the form of myth. Myth then, like style, is less about historical accuracy than it is about appropriation. And so it does not conceal anything while at the same time distorting everything. This is precisely what takes place in those acts of redoubling that clearly define what is valued and what is not. To redouble a concept, to think about thought, for example, is to highlight the concept's importance. Myth is about determining what is valued, not about what is true. Images are arrested in time, frozen as an eternal reference by the mythological narrative, the minute they are appropriated. A double process of what Bart referred to as stealing and restoring the symbol. Hence, myth transforms contingent history into eternal nature, while ignoring whatever nature may be in itself and not attempting to identify the truth of history. Myth only attempts to depoliticize speech and present itself as nature, which is, you could say, its main, its main task. It purifies things, as Bart put it, makes them innocent so that they appear to mean something by themselves. As one can easily detect in the reality of style as well, for myth, its elements are linked by associative relations. It's supported not by an extension, but by a depth. Its mode of presence is memorial. It becomes easier to see from this point of view why something like the analogy of being as a famous theological concept and construct becomes one of the main metaphysical supports linking humanity to a supposed divine being through the associative form of analogy itself, providing depth to humanity through the imago dei, while also reifying or memorializing God at the same time. The sovereignty that myth displays comes through its ability to be both imperfectible and unquestionable, as Bart put it, a statement made so that things might be made to appear simply as the way things are. Though mythology desires to present itself as truth, it's rather a practical tool, in his words, Men do not have with myth a relationship based on truth, but on use. They depoliticize according to their needs. Moreover, it's inherently caught up in political activity, 
for myth exists more fully on the right of a political spectrum, at home with proverbs, common sense, and the defense of a particular version of nature, then we could say on the left, where revolutionary tendencies often seek to eradicate the force of myth, which conserves and prevents. Bart's conclusions regarding the role of myth in our world acknowledge that we are permanently caught between these poles, and in a sense, without hope of resolving the tension once and for all. In his words, if we penetrate the object, we liberate it, but we destroy it. And if we acknowledge its full weight, we respect it, but we restore it to a state which is still mystified. It would seem that we are condemned for some time yet always to speak excessively about reality. Myth creates a context that we depend on, though it cannot fully account for the non-mythological elements that it generates, but which remain separate from it. What Bart does not say, but which is latent within his account of myth, is that not only must we develop a reconciliation between reality and humanity, between description and explanation, between object and knowledge, as he puts it, but we must understand how metaphysics is generated by the combination of myth and philosophy that dwells deep in the heart of Western thought. In this regard, we might consider the Czech philosopher, Jan Potochka, my, my thanks to Barton Kochi for introducing me to this philosopher's wonderful work. Uh, we might consider Jan Potochka and his account of the necessity of myth and its dualistic frameworks of good and evil, of an interior home and an external strangeness, of what we can rely on to stand on firm ground, and the foreignness that undermines our sense of security and self. His referencing the inherent dualities of myth dovetails, I believe, with Barth's account and can be linked, of course, to others with which we're very familiar. Divisions like the raw and the cooked, as in Levi Strauss, nature and culture, heaven and earth, identity and difference. As Patochka will declare, the privilege that humanity has in being aware of the duality of existence is also humankind's damnation and that we are made aware of the impossibility of suturing our existence together. Patochka's recognition of the tensions between myth and philosophy, however, is what gives us a window of insight into their mutual interlocking dynamic, one that ultimately gives rise to metaphysics in the West. Myth, he maintains, does not inspire wonder. It's rather a reflection of what is. Philosophy, however, begins in wonder and amazement, taking the place of the God whom myth recounts as being amazed at their own creation. Myth is focused on the past, whereas philosophy is firmly rooted in the present. Myth is a fantasy that's unaware of its being a fantasy, but which nonetheless offers something that speaks to the depths of our humanity. Philosophy seeks relentlessly to observe the reality of the present and the failures of our self-understanding. These two possibilities for the soul, as he puts it, are always present, leading to the bifurcated selves that we are and which still dominate our conceptions of ourselves. From the moment Greek thought introduced the capacity for self-reflection into its culture, unreflective myth was forced to incorporate the philosophical into its way of being. This is the act of redoubling I spoke about a minute ago. Myth becomes religion in Plato's work, for example, through the positing of an immortal soul as the first element of metaphysical speculation that sought to suture the mythological with the philosophical. Religion, or more specifically metaphysics, arises from the combination of myth and philosophical reflection that must justify one's need to immerse themselves in myth, despite myth's unrepentant fantasy, dwelling in fantasy. The divinity of transcendence itself, Patochka argues, arose from this formulation, meaning that from this point forward, religious dogma has to be justified since Plato has created the space for faith to be possible in a way it was not possible for those living exclusively within a purely mythological horizon. Though Patochka does not say as much in the context of his discussion of myth and philosophy giving rise to metaphysics, the reversion to pure myth would not only dispel philosophy, reflection, and even science from society, it would be the introduction of something like an authoritarian threat that was as present in ancient tyrannies as it is in modern totalitarian regimes. It's easy to see from this vantage point why the moderate acceptance of a tension between myth and philosophy that both Bard and Patochka signal is so off-putting to our contemporary ears. Such calls for moderation are decidedly not characteristic of the modern quest to end the reign of metaphysics seen as the harbinger of violence rather than as the restrainer of dissent back into a purely mythological horizon. Various forms of nihilism, for example, have sought to destroy the metaphysical systems of oppression that have been wedded to certain political forms in our world for centuries. 
in the wake of Nietzsche's proclamations concerning the death of God and the heart of nihilism that still, still circulates around us, contemporary thinkers have called repeatedly for various forms of nihilism, like Calvin Warren's black nihilism, for example, to end the necropolitics that has guided us for far too long in the West. So I want to shift to look at how Jean-Luc Nancy deals with myth to give us a way to think through this implication of the tensions we're faced with, but also the nihilisms that challenge us and the nihilisms that seek to put an end to our mythological narratives. Perhaps it's so difficult to dispel mythology entirely from human existence because myth constructs a narrative of origins that's bound up with the origins of consciousness itself and with the establishment of community, of humanity then grounded upon myth. In retelling a myth, the community founds itself through the sovereignty of self-grounding, what must always be done ex nihilo, and which means that creation myth, myths, these primal scenes as they were, are always bound up with the operations of myth. But, in here we must see, but and here we must seek to understand the limitations of mythology and metaphysics, even as they constrain the totalitarian nightmares of our world. This is precisely what Jean Nancy critiques as a myopic point of view, narrowly focused only on its own self-perpetuation. In his words, quote, the idea of myth alone perhaps presents the very idea of the West with its perpetual representation of the compulsion to return to its very own sources in order to re-engender itself from them as the very destiny of humanity. In this sense, I repeat, we no longer have anything to do with myth, end quote. Like those forms of nihilism that would see an end to myth and metaphysics, what's being undermined in the refusal of the myth of one's own origins being one's ground is the sense of sovereignty and so of self-grounding that results from only turning to your own origins in order to produce a future script. Undoing the hold of myth for Nancy actually entails turning to other narratives, other sources, those beyond one's own culture, nation, people, or history. What Western society witnessed at its origins was the intricate combination of an existing mythology and its use, the invention of myth, he notes, that he says is bound up with the use of its power. Myth is a revelation such that it declares itself, tautologically, to exist, thereby taking up its own existence and coming to be through its being spoken, consequently appearing as if nature were speaking directly to humankind. Myth is beyond dialectics because nothing is given or presupposed prior to its existence. As Nancy will summarily conclude, myth becomes its own enunciation, its own tautagory, as he calls it, equivalent to its own truth and its own realization, its own suppression and entirely new inauguration, and hence the final inauguration of the inaugural itself that myth has always been. This is why myth is considered as transcendent while also being intimately connected to a community, enabling the myth of a communion and demonstrating how community cannot exist outside of myth. The paradoxical statement Nancy makes concerning myth in relation to meaning, that myth is denied its meaning by its meaning, can be explained by the fact that though mythic thought can be defined as the thought of a founding fiction or a foundation by fiction, it cannot be judged according to a truth that is other than the one it creates for itself. Any meaning it possesses is one that gives itself, one that it gives itself, thus negating any possibility of a shared meaning arising that transcends the mythical narrative. Myth is only an operational or work, as Blumenberg had put it, that extends its truth into the formation of meaning itself. Even if the myth is entirely fictional, the life it gives becomes manifest within our world through the myth's operations. It becomes real in this sense, through the community and meaning that it creates. Myth becomes truth by establishing itself as figuration proper. Through language, myth, as Nancy puts it, performs the humanization of nature and or its divination and the naturalization of man and or his divination. Because the world created by myth is self-sustaining and all-encompassing, there is a totalitarian ethos to myth that cannot be disregarded or downplayed. It's fundamentally part of the nature of myth. Essentially, he says, myth's will to power was totalitarian. It may perhaps even define totalitarianism. The basis of mythological self-creation is to produce a completely circumscribed, even self-referential world 
wherein meaning is created, but also trapped within its own confines. Its power is total within its domain and its absolute self-referentiality is a mark of its propensity to create a metaphysics of its own. Hence, it must continually take and support abstracted meta positions, ones that evidence a redoubling characteristic of metaphysical speculation. Myths will, for example, and as Nancy will deduce, is always and only a will to will. In truth, Nancy is aware that trying to put an end to myth might be merely another way to sustain it, to introduce a pure, more ideological mythology, much as Adorno and Horkheimer had warned us against previously. For Adorno, of course, to attempt to destroy the fetish was only another way to guarantee that new fetishes would be created in its stead. Nancy, much like Adorno's negative dialectic, wants rather to interrupt myth, not to eradicate it altogether through some process of demythologization. Nancy wants to investigate the myth of myth, a negative redoubling, I would suggest, intended to counter the positive redoubling of mythological power and its totalitarian sheen. And so to understand what the stakes really are in the consistent redeployment of myth. Hence, his focus is placed on the interruption of myth brought about by myth itself, which shares with Bart and Patochka's assessments of myth giving rise to philosophy. Just as the interruption of community takes place, Nancy finds, at the edges of the community through the singular individuals who expose the limits of the community. As Nancy will phrase things, the interruption of myth is the voice of the interrupted community, the voice of the incomplete exposed community. It's the voice of literature, which is not suited to the myth of the community, nor to the community of myth. But literature's revelation, unlike myths, does not reveal a completed reality, nor the reality of a completion. It does not reveal in a general way something, he says, it reveals rather the unrevealable, namely that it is itself as a work that reveals and gives access to a vision and to the communion of a vision essentially interrupted. Unlike the totalitarian completions of mythology, Nancy says, myth is interrupted by literature precisely to the extent that literature does not come to an end. We are returned here by these reflections not only to Horkheimer and Adorno on the relationship of myth to literature as they wonderfully illustrated through their reading of Homer's Odyssey in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, but to the evolution of literature out of myth through the introduction of a critical philosophical distance that still gives rise to literary forms which mirror their contemporary modes of human self-reflection. The non-philosophical gives rise to the philosophical just as the literary arrives out of the non-literary. In Nancy's words, literature shares itself with an other. It enters into relationship existing as a mode of being in common, being for others and through others. The non-identity of the self and of literature even are opposed to the myth that grounds itself in itself and for only itself, which is what guarantees its sovereignty. Though there is a relation between literature and myth as between difference and identity. Literature is part of what Nancy calls the unworking that shares out our being in common. There is no mastery of this being in common, only a sharing of a history that has been given to us. Though Nancy's comments might be taken as a dismissal of myth entirely, I would rather read his remarks on myth as a cautionary tale of what takes place when we are bereft of philosophical critique and literary distance, so that all we are left with is the totalitarian nightmare of myth itself, a completely engulfing myth. If myth can interrupt itself, however, then there might be a relationship to myth that sees the birth of philosophy and literature without having to dispense with myth altogether. This is how I read his comments on the undermining of mythic authority. No more is there the mythic legitimacy that myth conferred upon its own narrator, Nancy puts it, Nancy says. Writing is seen rather as illegitimate, never authorized, risk exposed to the limit. But this is not a complacent anarchy, for it is in this way that writing obeys the law, the law of the community. The writer eventually learns that they can only have a voice insofar it's a singular voice that is also in common, the mythological element, I would add. Allowing one to be singular plural, as he puts it, without succumbing to the absoluteness of the mythical worldview. This is what allows Nancy to conclude that speech is communitarian in proportion to its singularity and singular in proportion to its communitarian truth. So by way of conclusion, in its Greek context, Myth allowed for a toleration of plurality. 
contradiction even, and was only relegated to means of untruth once philosophy as a quest for rational order and truth forced it to be defined as such. This was at the point, as I've been narrating, when myth gave birth to philosophical reflection as a probing of its own internal limits. When philosophical reasoning was joined to a sacred logos associated eventually with monotheism, um, as opposed to the plurality of a polytheistic mythos, the dominant strain of Western thought was given life and a unique brand of Western metaphys metaphysics appeared, though as Patochka makes clear, metaphysics was already present in Platonic thought before this Judaic Christian element was introduced. Chiara Botici, uh, like Bart and Patochka before her, affirms how there is a ceaseless dialectic between plurality and identity that cannot be eradicated, but which all of us are, but in which all of us are caught. If we fail to adhere to the tension, making an effort uh, instead to cling to only one side of it, we risk dismissing the wholeness of our humanity. Quote, plurality is what characterizes myth, but it points at the same time to a danger. The plurality of stories may turn into the recognition that there is no common story to be told, end quote. Identity needs common stories, which myth provides. As she goes on to say, when the plurality of political myth is denied, this is the sign that the instituted dimensions of the social imaginary is denied. Political myths live out of history. They have to remain open to change because they must provide significance to changing circumstances. In contrast, when political myths attempt a closure of meaning, the no more work is possible and the myths in question cannot be revised, but only dismissed together with the political regimes that have produced them. Well-known examples include the myth of Jewish theocracy, the myth of the Aryan race, and the Italian fascist myth of the glorious Roman past. These are myths which, by attributing the origins of the social significations of a society to an extra social source, gods, heroes, ancestors, they've covered up the instituted dimensions of society and thus subtracted it from the possibility of interrogation. Letting go of these myths, however, when they're so central to the social and political landscapes most familiar to us is not an easy thing to take in. It's as difficult as questioning the collective memories of a people battling over its present identity. We might consider in this regard a point made in David Reef's short study in Praise of Forgetting, where he criticizes the reliance upon collective memory in that it often refuses the ambiguity that is inherent in all memories in order to shore up a dominant collective, we'd say sovereign sense of self. People tend to prefer a mythologized version of their memory over historically accurate accounts while also providing opposition to multicultural, we say pluralistic or diverse perspectives that only seem to bring discord and disunity. We are all caught in a tension between sacralizing and banalizing the past, he, he finds, as humans are hardwired for loyalty and certainty, not ambivalence. His intriguing call for a shared ambivalence about historical events, which actually reflects the reality of being perpetually caught between plurality and identity, may be a perfectly suitable solution to the modern impasse between myth and science, but it's also less than appealing to the polarized partisan dynamics that receive so much of our attention these days. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there. Those are, those are my remarks, but I'm happy to say more and to clarify and add and well, do any, any sort of trick you wanna see. <laughs> thank you very much, Colby. Thanks for your lecture. Uh, I have already received some uh, requests for the full paper, so I, I'll be happy as, as I typed already. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask Colby if he's willing to circulate it with, with the others. Sure, that'd be great. Um, thank, you. Oops. thank you, Colby, once again. And uh, as we discussed with uh, Colby and Nikki beforehand, um, the disadvantage of uh, online lecture is that we don't have wine and cheese as the icebreaker. So believe it or not, I'll try to do the icebreaking now, which is, <laughs> which is a joke in itself. But uh, Colby, when I was listening to your lecture, I was thinking of uh, sovereignty within the discourse of um, identity and difference, because that is a discourse I can, so to say, orient myself a bit. And um, 
I was thinking of the question of responsibility that is very much present in the in the work of Jacques Derrida. And this in this respect, uh, sovereignty is something that is way beyond responsibility to anyone, to anything. So in my understanding, the sovereign is someone who is not responsible to anyone, not responsive, not immediately, yeah, uh, ready to hear, so to say. And um, I think we've been uh, having these discussions about the troubles with sovereignty from like already from, yeah, from, from the myths, from, from, from uh, the times of the conception of the Hebrew Bible. We have already uh, many uh, commentators from the social, uh, social science uh, reading of, of the Hebrew Bible saying that um, the fall of Solomon, the King Solomon, uh, was the fact that he did not obey uh, the, the law of the land. He enslaved or uh, he put, uh, uh, he enforced the forced work on, on people. He uh, treated them as if they were his property. He did not uh, respect that he is responsible. He is responsible to his people and to God. Another example from the Hebrew Bible is King Ahab. And this is, this is an interesting, I find this, um, interpretation also interesting that uh, King Ahab was not uh, the, the biblical story about uh, Naboth's vineyard and uh, the role of King Ahab is not that he was too greedy, that he wanted to steal uh, the vineyard, but uh, actually the, uh, he broke Again, he broke the land, uh, the law land, the land, uh, the land law, and he wanted to uh, possess something that is beyond the human possession. That uh, he wanted to to, uh, to to take away the inheritance of the land, which is uh, by the prohibition, uh, by the uh, by the law prohibited to to uh, to sell. So. And we can go on through the history and we have our sovereigns of today. You conquered the, the sovereign in the United States the last year. We in the Czech Republic, thankfully, conquered the sovereign this uh, last weekend. And um, now I, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, you opened your paper with uh, with the, the naked emperor and the child crying out that the emperor is naked and the bystanders were just watching and then uh, also joining in that the emperor is naked. And now I'm coming back to the question of responsibility. And uh, in this sense, uh, the child is somewhat hyper, hyper responsive, uh, hyper responsible in the situation that he, that it found itself, because it was, uh, it was not his responsibility to say that the emperor was naked, and, uh, or at least it was not uh, his, like, he was not the only responsible for, for that. And now I'm coming to, uh, um, to the key topic of, of, uh, of responsibility, and that is the Derridean or Kierkegorian, here I am, the, the ability to stand up, to take up this responsibility and to say, here I am. And uh, this is something that and you, uh, you mentioned Patochka, and I'm really happy and <laughs> thankful for that. That is something that uh, I think we, uh, this is a third movement. This is something that is not normal. That is not something that is normally happening. That is already something that is way beyond uh, the, the normal response of people. And 
I think, or at least what, what I can go, go through, through the history and also, yeah, I think this is, this is something that is happening, uh, like, this is something that is timeless. We, we don't have like, a, if, if, we, if we connect it with the, with the time, it's like a, the, the possibility that somewhere, someone stay, stands up and, and, and responds is like in the, connect, uh, in the, in the connection to, to history, this is like, a, um, yeah, this is, this is a timeless topic. And uh, one question I would like to ask is uh, from the conclusion, you said that, um, and uh, this is maybe a question of clarification. I'm not sure if I understood you correctly. You said that uh, myth is, uh, can contain or allows for plurality. The Greek concept of myth uh, allows for plural plurality. And I was puzzled, I have to say, uh, in the sense that you also mentioned Girard and um, for Girard, the founding myth is something that works against any sort of plurality. You have the founding myth of um, the founding murder, Cain and, uh, Cain and Abel. Cain uh, kills Abel and that is, that is it. And it all works for the uh, for the stronger identity, for the community to expel all the all the all the difference that could possibly be there, and uh, so I, I I I'm wondering if you maybe can clarify this how how you meant it uh, if I have misunderstood you in this respect. Also, you spoke about uh, myth and philosophy and how they how these two uh, respond to one another and uh, myth being the pre-historical, pre-reflexive. And that also goes more for the strong identity to build the, the, to get rid of any possible difference and uh, to kind of um, strongly integrate and uh, the, the community and build on the on the on the strong identity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for your observation uh, observations and also your question. I, I have a lot of things that I would like to say in response. Um, I'll start with the idea of the plurality in relation to some sort of singular narrative, um, which is embodied more in the concept of logos as opposed to how. Uh, if I'm saying the name correctly, Botici, the Italian scholar who talks about uh, the idea of the mythos being aligned with the plural, plural, uh, pluralized sense of polytheistic understanding, whereas the logos for her is much more of a you know, singular and even a, almost metaphysical understanding. I think, I think there's definitely a, a tension here that it, it would be sort of a critique of some of Girard's insights, perhaps a, a different reading of what he's trying to do, but also a, a way of trying to see how myth itself, if taken in its plurality, as a plurality of stories and narratives that, in fact, there's no one consistent narrative to say this is how it has to be, uh, provides something like what Nancy was trying to call a myth of myth. There's something active even within the mythological element that also serves to undermine the myth itself, or let's say the dominance of the myth itself. And I do think Girard was very attentive to that in his attempts to, to read through the Judaic and the Christian narratives and to say, there is a way in which we could read this as not aligned with myth as a, a justification for certain forms of violence, for example, but we could read it as sort of the, the myth of myth and sort of in a taking down of that myth. And I think this is where, uh, not to get too technical with Girard's thought, but he doesn't spend a lot of time trying to talk about, you know, First Samuel eight or the idea of a, a theocracy arising in Jewish thought, or even the tensions between what I sometimes would call, following Paul Ricoeur, more legalistic strands of the Jewish myth and more prophetic strands of the Jewish myth. You mentioned the 
the here I am, which is, of course, the prophetic call we see in Isaiah, Jeremiah, all these prophets. But there's also a legalistic side that takes, you know, almost a very opposite stance to the prophet's perspective. You see that in Ezra and Nehemiah and so many others in the Hebrew scriptures. And I think that tension is something that could, you know, it shows us that there are certain elements, even just in this one religious tradition, elements that want to preserve a sovereign view and elements that want to see it come undone. And that tension is never fully resolved. So that there's even sort of a, a tension between the singular and the plural, even within what we could broadly call that you know, mythology or the, that sustains that religious view. And I think that's something that I'm trying to point toward here in suggesting that you know, we're never fully able to back away from that tension. We have to recognize how its various elements play themselves out in the establishment of a myth and its alignment with mythology as this, you know, uh, or sorry, its alignment with the metaphysics as it gives rise to something like a philosophical reflection, but at the same time, at the same time, how that seems to justify and legitimate the myth being there in the first place. It's, it's to say the myth wants to go toward a, an identification that could risk being totalitarian if there's no corrective force, if there's no one taking responsibility or, or what you, I think, rightly call the hyper-responsibility that wants to critique that and to say there has to be something more that comes out of this. Those two can't be severed. They have to actually be in some constant form of tension. And mm -hmm. I think, I won't get fully into this, but this is why Gerard's thought is so interesting. You get people who read his thought, like Gianni Vadimo, who read it in a, a very secular sense, saying we need to then move away from any sort of order that is basically condoning violence. Whereas Gerard himself was much more inclined to say we need religion to function as a catacomb, as a restrainer of the violence so that it doesn't get more out of control. And I think that that possibility of reading it both ways is why mm -hmm. we're very much always gonna be looking at something like the, the Jewish religious perspective. It's, I'm speaking here mainly of its scriptural self-understanding and to say, yes, there are legalistic elements that seek to have almost a totalitarian order. Yeah. Like when, when Nehemiah tells the, uh, tells the Jewish people who hear the reading of the law to grab the foreign wives and drag them by their hair out of the community. They do not belong. Uh, but then you get the other side of it, the prophet saying, who cares about your rules? God wants justice to flow like, like water. You know, and you see the tension in that way and it's constant. It never seems to dissipate. It has to be maintained in some sense. I can see the, uh, the, rule, uh, the role of the myth uh, in the way of protection and building up the identity so that we don't just, you know, shatter into pieces. But I don't see, and especially not with Girard, uh, maybe it's just uh, my, you know, <laughs> one cell like turning in the, in the brain. I cannot see the plurality within, within the myth because I think, I mean, of course we can say the, the um, Gilgamesh epic is a, a myth that is common to all the Near Eastern cultures. And there are stories, particular stories, if you meant it that way, that are particular to particular cultures. But uh, I think that like the, the very reason of myth is to destroy plurality. But, uh, but anyway, there is, a, there is a question and I'll, <laughs> I'll rather well, read the question. Well, I, would, I would just simply say, I, I don't think it's an issue that Gerard deals with and, and not in the way I was trying to address in the paper. Yeah, it's, and I, and I, I know exactly what you're saying. That's why Botici's comments about how myth, although it's hard to dispute her, her findings, you know, myth in its Greek form has a very pluralistic element to it, but that's something that really hasn't been thought through mm. uh, more fully. Maybe she uses it in a, in a different way, like the term. I, I think so to some degree, yeah. But I, I do think it would be interesting to put that more in dialogue with exactly the dynamic you're talking about, which is what Nancy was saying, that myth always strives for this totalitarian dimension. It's always, there, and there's certainly a oneness behind that mm. in order to maintain its authority and sovereignty. In yeah, sense. well, in Girard, this is the this is the the idea of sacrifice, right? It's based on the myth and the 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 need of the myth to expel anything different. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I'll I'll read uh, Ludger's uh, question. Uh, I wonder if not any emancipatory agenda per se must also be metaphysical and oppressive in the in the in the quotation marks as you put it. 
what are the ideals of what you call emancipatory nihilism? Is this nihilism transitional? And if so, transitional to what? And how would it relate to Nietzsche's active and passive nihilism? <coughs> Thank you very much for that question. It's great. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly the distinction with Nietzsche's active and passive. I'll have to, I'll have to come back to that one. I, mean, I was actually writing about that last spring. So it's, it's, it's one of those things that I was, I've written things, a chapter in a book that make the distinction, but I'm having trouble at the moment <laughs> linking that one in. Um, let me speak about the first part of your question. This is, this is the, the, the main question that haunts, it certainly haunts theology and theological conversations. I, I see it in my, in my department, in my worlds quite frequently. You have so many, so many, let's say, more orthodox defenders of an institutional structure who spend a lot of their time crying out about the nihilism that still haunts our modern world and how it's threatening to take apart and destroy religion and all the, the things that religion has brought to us and to our world. And then you see, and I'm thinking there of someone like the radical Orthodox theologian, John Milbank. I, I don't find his take very helpful, but he sees nihilism in every bush. It's out to get him. I, I think what we're talking about here in something like Calvin Warren's notion of black nihilism is a sense that the metaphysical structures that we have cultivated and solidified in, in the West predominantly, and he's speaking to a, a Judeo-Christian tradition specifically, have been things that have been wedded to sovereign forms of imperialism or uh, racisms. Uh, this is where uh, Achille Mbimbe talks about necropolitics as that, that congealed sense of sovereign power that needs to be confronted with something like an emancipatory nihilistic force that wants to see the end of these structures come to pass. Now, would we call this, so I love the way you phrase it in your question, would we call this a, something like a transitory stage? Is it just transitional to something else? Or is it something that always accompanies every, you know, every construct that comes with us? And I don't think this is a question that, you know, Calvin Warren's just simply saying, we need to end these structures. They are violent, they are oppressive. And he does not spend, as you can imagine, does not spend any time talking about, well, what comes next? What, what exactly do we envision? Um, I think it's more along the lines of a recognition of how the nihilism is always balanced or in some sort of tension with whatever the metaphysical structure is that accompanies it. And in that sense, I think you know, Nietzsche's comments about nihilism are very predictive, let's say, of how that problem continues to follow us or, or to haunt us in some sense. I think the emancipatory nihilisms that we're looking at are in that sense helpful, perhaps even necessary to deal with, but I wouldn't say they're wholly destructive of every, every institution or identity we have, though they do wish to see a complete recreation of how we understand those things and what they are. So yes, it's certainly transitional in some sense, but I don't think we can give it a, uh, I don't think we can simply stamp it and say it wants to do away with everything so that therefore there's something completely different we've never seen before. I think it's more like subtle changes and variations to whatever we understood something to be beforehand. Maybe an example, this would be something like, uh, we spend a lot of time these days, uh, certainly at my university, discussing how the way in which we've understood the gender binary, male, female, it no longer holds in the same way it used to hold. Now we have we have non-binary genders and third genders and all kinds of new categories that make some people uncomfortable and others simply say, well, this is just the way things are. It doesn't mean we've done away with the terms male and female, but we certainly perceive them very differently than we did before. Uh, I think it's something more along those lines. To end the way in which we perceive racism, we're going to have to ask very serious questions about how we've understood race and what that means going forward. And I think that's a big part of what these emancipatory nihilisms are trying to point toward. So I hope that's that's something like a, a sketch of an answer. <laughs> okay, uh, there is another question uh, from Jakub. If I am understanding, if I understand you correctly, you maintain that a myth can be dangerous partially because of its pluralistic plasticity and primarily and because of that of its openness for different using for the use of for like legitimization of political powers and hierarchies. But on the other hand, this pluralism of a myth 
or of a mythical creation or imaginary, it is also worth to save because it can be subversive. It can be used to those who are dominated and plastically changed by them. If my understanding is correct, what's the relation between the polytheistic pluralism and universalism? And second question, how the idea of political myth by Georges Sorel could be or couldn't be of use in your paper? Thanks. Great well, can, Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I can answer the second part very quickly. I'm, I'm, Sorel's work is sitting there on my shelf, but I have not gone through it yet. So I, I do not know how I would incorporate that. I would love to incorporate that further. Um, maybe you could enlighten me as to how you would see it be incorporated. Um, but to, to speak to the first part, um, let me try to address this concept of universalism, because this is what I find to be the most fascinating here in relation to the, the possible pluralistic elements we're looking at. Um, I do think there's something like a universal dimension that's opened up through what I was alluding to in the paper, and I'm, I'm dealing with this in a larger work that I'm working on, through instead of the, the positive notion of redoubling that Barth talked about, how myth always takes a meta position, that there's something like what Nancy is trying to develop as a negative redoubling. And what I linked in my paper, though I didn't go fully into it, but to a negative process of redoubling, uh, what I linked to Adorno's notion of a negative dialectic. I think that is precisely the dimension of where something like a universal, a universal uh, appeal or universalism develops, but it's not a universality that becomes accessible to us through a positive redoubling, through a positive, let's say, implementation of a universal view, which I would be, I think most people these days would be very critical of as a false universalization. An attempt to say, this is very much like that. These are all the same. We can just throw them together in, in a basket of sameness and er eradicate their differences or downplay the differences in order to promote a more universal perspective or position. That would be a false universalism. Uh, like, like when people would speak about, uh, you know, this is what we assume, like the use of we, where you then incorporate marginalized groups who don't agree with that position. And you say, but I'm gonna use the we to speak for all of us, but you're really not. You're, you're, you're eliminating, you're excluding, you're pushing out the marginalized voice so that you can present a more universal position on a particular issue. That's not the form of universalism I'm speaking about here with this negative concept of redoubling. Rather what's happening, and as Adorno would put it, uh, in, in his reading of Hegel's negation of negation, is you actually perform something that goes the opposite direction. It's a universal gesture is made, but only in so far as you've sort of hollowed out or rendered mute the identity that came through the positive redoubling. The simplest way I can put this, I think, is at least in my understanding, I do equate Hegel's notion of the negation of negation or the way Adorno uses it in a negative dialectic with the way that uh, Agamben talks about the division of division. So when he reads St. Paul's letter to the Romans, and he, this is a strange religious connection even, but he says, every identity, like the classic Jew-Gentile division, which is a social division, that primary division is actually divided again into what Paul calls the flesh and the spirit. So that you can be a Jew, he says, in the flesh, or you can be a Jew in the spirit. And making that second division doesn't give you a new identity that you can then marginalize others with on a political or social spectrum. It's actually one that sort of hollows out your own identity. So that if there is a sense of there being a universal connection between the, the forms of life that we are beyond the labels that identify us, our creaturely being, it's only something we can access through the dissolution of our identities, through a recognition that we are all perhaps bereft of what we thought our identities were going to be. So it's a way of saying, instead of allowing the sovereign gestures of identity that we all are inscribed into to identify us, we actually experience the failure of our identities. And only in that way do we access something like a universal space. Okay, so it's through the failure of the representation. That's where this universalism I think comes from. And in that sense, it certainly relates to a plurality but it's a plurality that's one that's sort of divides the internal consistency of who we are. 
we're further divided. And so it's always going to be an additional, um, you know, an additional map. There's more elements at work here. And in that plural configuration of identity, we're actually undone from within by the identities we thought had characterized us from without. So in that sense, uh, and, and this goes back to the question here too, I would say myth can be used in a, in a very totalitarian manner, let's say, when it's used only to reinforce those identities that you know, we take and we use as sovereign gestures to marginalize or exclude other people. But when we actually allow ourselves to be subdivided from within because we realize there are more plural elements even within us, right? Then we realize that our identities are undone. And when they're undone, we actually can reach out or experience something like a universal connection, but it's only through the undoing of those sovereign mythological identities. So it's like saying, uh, uh, if I put forward like a, a real rugged, rough, masculine sense of identity, I'm only able actually to reach out and to understand what someone's going through when I realize that false sovereign gesture can be undone by, well, the ways I fail to be that masculine man, or I realize the feminine side of myself or, or whatever. We could talk about multiple ways in which that identity can be undone. And when we undo it, we allow it to be subversive, as you put it. Um, and it's, it really also allows us to cease the dominations and privileges that have been characterizing the sovereign identities that we were perpetuating through mythological means. So I hope that's a, a way to address the, the issue there. Would you agree uh, with the criticism of uh, like the shattered identities, the criticism that, uh, for example, Yulia Kristeva addresses to um, Derrida, that we uh, do actually need some sort of identity for solidarity to be able to uh, somewhat uh, stand up together against oppression, that we cannot simply break into pieces all, all the identities that we are carrying within ourselves. Yeah, I, I mean, I do. And I think, I think even Derrida sort of agreed with this at certain points. He, he has an interview where he, he does, and she is not correct in, in, in her criticism. I don't think she... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Derrida, <laughs> yeah, Derrida has a, a very interesting interview where he says, people think I want to destroy all canonical norms, but actually I'm tempted to defend them. Uh, you know, he says, but they're always subject to a deconstruction, but you're going to have to have them at some point too. I certainly agree with that. Um, and I think it's very difficult for us to recognize how that's, that's an important part of our identity. I, I call it in my paper, the necessary illusion that we have. It's, it's always subject to a deconstruction, but of course it's something that we're going to have to have to get by. I think of this also along the lines of um, <clears throat> the very interesting comments that Judith Butler has made about, about uh, gender identity, but also with gay marriage. You know, she makes an, an amazing argument where she says, look, I understand that to allow gay marriage to be you know, recognized as official, we have to say that it's natural to be gay. We have to then argue that this can be a collective and a group of people who are recognized by a society. But then she says, but I also want to sort of cling to the non-normative understanding that we're always choosing our identity at some level, and we're also always not able to fully put it into a box. And she says, sort of both are true at the same time. And I think that's a, a really honest recognition that yes, we're going to fail completely. You know, in, in my paper, I talked about myth as related to style, um, which is something that, that Nazi uh, sorry, I think Bart talks about it. And I think that's helpful because it's completely different, for example, to deconstruct the self along those lines. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was an uh, announcement recording stopped and <laughs> recording renewed. <laughs> um. So uh, yeah, so I'll I'll read a follow up, but um, one more thing to Judith Butler, I I think we still need some sort of identity that is um, transferable throughout time. I don't think we can uh, build anything sustainable on on uh, self that just happens and 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 is gone in a minute. So I think I'd, I I'm more with uh, with Kristeva, and I think also with Derrida. Uh, and Kristava's uh, uh, misinterpretation of Derrida that we <laughs> do need some sort of uh, 
weak identity or so or plural identities but not just a self that happens in act and uh, to to build up solidarity uh Jakub, uh okay i like it and i agree with you uh perhaps you can name this idea a negative universalism a universalism of our common as human beings emptiness yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion, something like that. I was simply trying to borrow you know, Adorno's notion of a negative dialectic, uh, but I think it does give rise to something like a negative, <clears throat> excuse me, a negative universalism of sorts. And I think it's also something that points inevitably toward what, uh, what you were just suggesting, Kaka, the, the idea of a, uh, like a canonic identity, something that's constantly pouring itself out, a weak identity in that sense, because you know, what, what Paul recognizes in his letter to the Romans, and I think what Christianity tries to embody as a philosophical principle, if I can say that, um, is that we're all, you know, all our identities are subject to this, this deconstruction, and that renders us universal to connect to each other, but only through that negative process. Now, of course, Christianity historically betrays itself almost immediately. Uh, you know, and immediately reinscribes itself as an institution back into, you know, sovereign structures of power and identity and even stamping out the heretics and burning them at the stake, not, in fact, going into its own emptiness or its own weakness. And this is why I'm more intrigued by, by those readings, especially intellectual historical readings of Christianity, that tend to ponder more if this secular space or the absence of religion is not, in fact, a more authentic witness to the Christian canonic pronouncement of identity, not necessarily just of its God, but of identity itself. That by entering into that space where we deny, you know, the sovereign force of those identities and we seek rather to engage this negative universalism, we encounter something like a canonic ability that really is the best testament to what it is we're doing. It's why I find myself in a very strange position as a technically a professor of theology but one, who, but one who feels like if Christianity were to entirely vanish and negate itself and pour itself out to the point that it disappeared, might that be the most you know, authentic testament to what Christianity is actually about? And maybe that's the best way to go. It doesn't give me job security, but it seems like maybe that's the actual, <laughs> the actual <laughs> emphasis for what uh, Christianity is pointing toward in terms of embracing that emptiness in that sense, yeah. All right. Do, do we have some more questions? I don't see any. In that case, um, Colby, I would like to thank you for your lecture. Thanks thank for you. being with us. Well, and uh, we know about you, Colby, that you like to come to Vienna. So. Very much so. When my, when... <laughs> When the pandemic isn't so chaotic in my home environment and uh yeah it would be lovely to to think about that yes so no no not next time ne next year in jerusalem but maybe next year in vienna <laughs> <laughs> always a lovely thought i would love that <laughs> thank you okay. for inviting me very much this is this is a wonderful opportunity to to speak with you and to speak with some people there and also present some of the work i'm doing i hope it's uh informative in some way thank you but just just to clarify, am I authorized to uh, circulate your paper with with the with the participants? Sure. Yes. Great. Yes. Yep. Okay. And I, and I welcome any emails or questions anyone might have. Certainly. Good. Thank you very much, Colby. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating, listening, typing questions, and being with us this evening. Goodbye and good evening. Thank you. Bye.